I'm thankful for the Assembly of Saints like we do on this Lord's Day, Sunday morning and Sunday night. Uh, but um, it's uh, the Lord Jesus that makes Satan run. And let's stay close to the Lord, stay close to our Savior. Savior, like a shepherd, lead us. Much we need thy tender care. And that certainly uh, is the truth. Um, well, Blake told me before service, he said, he said, how about you preach 20 minutes, he said. <laughs> That's because he saw the stuff all set up back there, games. We got some games for the kids in the back room. And I looked at him, he said, okay, 30. So we've negotiated at 30. So let's uh, see how we can <laughs> work this out, right? <laughs> Oh, my. Praise the Lord. Good to have fun. Uh, the power of one another. The power of one another. And we'll all turn tonight to John chapter number 13, please. We began this last week, this particular um, uh, study on the power of one another. Last week was members one of another. And tonight is love one another. Love one another. Love has become a catch-all word for everything, right? You know, I love Snickers bars or, um, you know, sort of a catch-all word. And so um, to really understand, I think, to really understand it tonight, let's find out what the Bible says about this thing of love. And uh, I think God's definition, you would agree with me that God's definition, the definition in the Word of God is the definition we want. And in order to understand this, love one another. Uh, and by the way, just, uh, just to mention here for introduction, you don't have to understand Greek to know what love means. Sometimes I feel like that is a, is a standard in Christianity. Well, if you need to know what love means, you've got to know agape and filio. And, and uh, the Bible has plenty to say about love. And you just, if you just study love, you find out what love means. And you find out what all different kinds of love means. Uh, and the different uh, types exemplified in the Word of God. Uh, so in John chapter number 13, we'll read a little bit here to, to uh, get the sense of the passage and ask the Holy Spirit to speak to us tonight on this very, very important subject of love one another. So chapter 13 and verse number 31. I'm sorry, later in the chapter there, 31. So you may have to turn uh, to make your way to verse number 31. Therefore, when he was gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified. And God is glorified in him. If God be glorified in him, God shall also glorify him in himself and shall straightway glorify him. Little children, yet a little while I am with you. Ye shall seek me, and as I said unto the Jews, whither I go, ye cannot come. So now I say to you, a new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. It's a very powerful passage of Scripture. Just for the setting, we should understand the setting. Anytime you read the Bible, it's good to understand the setting. Read a little bit ahead, read a little bit later, find out the setting. And uh, here's a little interesting Bible trivia. Uh, in the book of John, the first 12 chapters are really revealing to us three and a half years of Jesus' life in 12 chapters. And once we come to chapter number 13, all the way through till almost the end, chapter number 13, probably until uh, chapter number 19 or 20, that really is a 24-hour period. So sometimes we don't look at the Bible that way, but what we're going to read here in these, really these eight, eight chapters or so is is a, a tremendous amount of detail regarding just one day of the Lord Jesus Christ. And also to have the setting, uh, uh, to sort of get a setting of this uh, passage, Jesus and the disciples are in the upper room. And you remember he told them to go, uh, there'll be a room that's furnished and ready, and, and, and go prepare yourselves, and, and we will meet there. Uh, and also know this tonight, it helped me out a lot, Sometimes we get together for certain times and it's just like, hey, you want to go get some lunch? Uh, or let's just go get a meal. Uh, this time that Jesus had with his disciples in the upper room was, was not something that was just, uh, hey, let's do this real fast. Uh, that time here in this upper room, uh, Jesus had an agenda to accomplish there. 
He had something he wanted to teach, some things he wanted to share. I mean, in just 24 hours, he'd be crucified. And uh, so this is, this is not uh, unplanned. This is very much planned. And so these words that we read tonight about loving one another, this is something Jesus planned to say, something he intended to teach uh, before he departs, as we have read uh, in this passage. The Bible says that we should love one another. And if you've been saved for a long time, as I have, the subject of loving one another almost is so common that we'll say, well, what more can we learn or understand about loving one another? Uh, but yet at the same time, I have known the Lord long enough and been saved long enough that the more I under, or e e even examine loving one another, especially how the Word of God presents it, it seems like a well that gets deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. And there's more facets to examine every time we take a look. Loving one another is not so much liking one another, and I say that very carefully because there are some people in this world that we just don't connect with the same way, and that's okay. We're not always going to have an, 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 an emotional, uh, uh, easy uh, relationship with someone or a personality easy relationship with someone. But this great Bible command to love one another goes beyond liking. So when Jesus brought his disciples to this upper room, uh, it was for a purpose. And the text that we read, although we'll look a little bit earlier in the chapter also, but did you notice how many times the word glorified or glorify is in this text? Glorify and glorify. Glorified, glorify. Jesus said, I will be glorified very soon. And I, I, I would believe that many of you tonight know what he's referring to. He's referring to his crucifixion. A little while I'm with you and then I'll be glorified. And, and just allow me to speak as a man tonight. I sort of objected to the word. I'm just, uh, we trust the words of God, but I objected to it some because I thought, where's the glory in that? Hanging on a cross, bleeding, beaten, unrecognizable, as the gospel accounts say. Sneering and mocking and laughter and jesting. And uh, probably vulgarities from the thieves on both sides and gambling for his clothes. Where's the glory in this? Where's the glory in this? And, and the truth is there's no glory in it be, in looking at it from our side, right? We look at it as the most despicable act human beings could have ever done. To crucify the Lord of glory and the Son of God and the sinless Son of God at that. But I think from, from the divine side, from, the, from God's side, it is a glorious thing. Because from the Father's side, from, we're talking about from, from God's side, from the side of heaven, from the side of, of, uh, of the Lord, this glorification, although evil in man's eyes, it's man at its worst. It's man at their worst. But it's God at his best. Loving the unlovely, but God commendeth his love toward us, you know, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The Father looks at that and says, what a glorious thing. How about the obedience of Jesus? See, we studied yesterday in our men's Bible study, Jesus was talking earlier in chapter 12 about his crucifixion, and he said, how could I pray to be delivered from this hour? It's for this hour I came forth. And the obedience of Christ, what a glorious thing from heaven's perspective of the obedience of Christ and the, and the sacrifice of the Lord. And, and um, so in that way, it is glorious from the divine perspective. It is glory. And God had, has turned, he's, he, he has indeed turned what is evil in, in, on man's side to certainly something glorious. And, and if, if you'll just think about this with me for a moment, even the image of the cross we don't think about as being despicable anymore. Is that true? It is. I, I don't look at the image of a cross and think, oh, that's terrible. You know, when I look at the image of, cross, of a cross, now well, Jesus isn't on it. When I look at the image of a cross, I think that's wonderful. He died for me, rose again for me, and is living for me. God has allowed that terrible event to become the most glorious event 
And Jesus said, if God be glorified in him, speaking of himself, and shall also glorify him in himself, then shall straight, uh, and shall straightway glorify him. It was all about the glory of God. And if we can just take a step back for a moment, everything about our salvation is for the glory of God. You remove the glory of God from salvation, none of us are saved. In other words, let me say it this way. If God didn't get glory by saving humanity, there wouldn't be no salvation for humanity. Because the glory of God is the highest end ever. And it is the most necessary end, the glory of God. From a divine perspective, it is glory. And then he told his disciples, little children, yet a little while I am with you. Um... Jesus was only with them for a short time. I'm sure those years went by like that. As it does in our relationship with others, doesn't it? Doesn't it seem like when you bury a loved one, it's like the time went by just like that. Life does go by that fast. And all through he was warning his followers that he would depart, but he gave them this comfort that I will send one unto you, the comforter. And I'm thankful for him today. Are you the comforter, the Holy Spirit? Praise God for uh, that person of the Trinity living within. So let's take a moment and, and look here at this, uh, great com uh, this great instruction and commandment uh, to love one another as in chapter, 30, or chapter 13, verse 34 and 35. Here's the first thing I want you to remember, and if you're writing these down, it might, it might help, that this is commandable. Commandable. Not commendable, but commandable. It's an injunction, and it's authoritative in that Jesus said, love one another. You say, well, why is that so important? In verse 34, he says it's a new commandment. It's a new commandment. And understanding that it's a commandment lifts it out of the realm of emotion and moves it over into the realm of decision. You see that? So... We often think of love as always staying in the realm of emotion. But here, here's a question for us tonight. Which of us can command our emotions? We can't. Can't command our emotions. But we can command a choice to love. So if, if I can just take it to this uh, extent, and I, and I don't think this is in any injustice to uh, this great truth, there are times when we may not feel love towards someone. And that's okay. Because we can't always command our feelings. But we can decide to love. To love. It's commandable. If we were to put together a biblical definition of loving one another, of this subject of, 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 of love in this context, it would be choosing to pursue the welfare of another by the pattern that Christ gave us. Pursuing or choosing to pursue the welfare of another in the pattern that Christ gave us. So here's a question. Jesus said, love your enemies. And I would venture to say that all of us tonight would admit together that when it comes to loving our enemies, it's not the super nice butterfly feelings we get in our heart. Like, oh, this is so good. It feels so good. It really, truly doesn't. But it is so good. It may not feel so good, but it is so good. That's why Jesus can say, love your enemies. Because this subject of love lifts, is lifted out of the realm of emotion and placed into the realm of decision. It's commandable. Commandments can be obeyed. Uh, the decisiveness is there also in marriage. I have had a couple of times when I uh, have been counseling a, 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 a couple in, in regards to their marriage. And I have heard this statement more than once. And maybe you've heard it too. I don't love them anymore. What a sad statement. I don't love him anymore. I don't love her anymore. And you know, they're really focusing the love on the emotion side. I think if we were to probe a little further, they'll say, I just don't feel it. I don't feel that love anymore. But that, but love isn't supposed to be a feeling as much as it is a decision. 
And the healthy marriages that are in this sanctuary tonight understand that love is a decision. And love is a daily choice. A daily choice. Someone says, well, I can't love them. This love is not in the side of can and can't. Or else Jesus wouldn't call it a commandment. Right? It's on the side of will or won't. You see? It goes from can or can't to will or won't. And even the fruit of the Spirit, what is the first one? It's love. This, this, uh, this quote is not original with me, but uh, I think it, it, it helps in, in, in this uh, particular line. Whatever God commands comes with his enablements. Every command of God comes with his enablements. And I'll admit that there have been times that I've said to the Lord, I can't. But in reality, I could, as he enables. Jesus said, without me, ye can do nothing. So this idea of loving one another, believers loving one another, is a decision. It's part of decisiveness. It is, it is actually obeying a command rather than seeking a feeling or an emotion. And this makes it possible to love the irregular people. Anybody got any of those? You're like, yeah, they're sitting right around me somewhere. <laughs> Loving the irregulars. It's not always natural. It's not always automatic to love the irregular. But yet we choose to obey Christ's commands. And it is at this time where Jesus only has 24 hours before his crucifixion. And he's got so much he wants, I'm sure, to wrap up with his followers, these, these disciples. And one of the important things that he wants to wrap up before he goes to the cross, he says, I'm going to give you a commandment here. You love one another. Seems pretty important, doesn't it? Super important. I want us to look at another word in verse number 34 that uh, may, have, may go unnoticed if we're not careful. And it's the little word new. Look at verse number 34. So Jesus said a new commandment. And we scratch our heads, I scratch my head, and I say, okay, wh what makes this thing so new? I mean, is it as though any of the disciples here in this upper room said, oh, love, what a great idea. We've never really heard about loving before. L uh, love is in the Old Testament. I don't know if you uh, e even have read in Leviticus chapter 19, where God said even to the Jews, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. It was in Leviticus. So loving God and loving your neighbor wasn't something new. It had, it had been around since the beginning. Adam loved Eve, his wife. So what makes it so new? Why did Jesus say that I'm giving you a new commandment? What is the newness of this thing? I believe this is the newness, and this really encouraged me and, and helped me. The newness is the pattern by which we are to practice it. Look here at this text again, verse number 34. A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another, semicolon. Now here's the new part. As I have loved you, that ye also love one another. You know what the newness of it was? They had been for three and a half years, vividly, had a vivid display of Christ's love. And now even in this upper room, they had even in a more emphatic way possibly had a, had, a, had a powerful example of the love of Jesus Christ. And he said, here's the new commandment I have, not just to love, it's been around forever, but love like I've loved you. Do that. That's new. That's certainly new. We don't have time to look at it all here tonight with my time constraints that have been put on me this evening um, but in chapter number 13 you know this, this is our Sunday night crowd you know Jesus washed some feet up in that room we all know that story right? we all, we all remember it and uh, you know it wasn't normal for the teacher to wash the students feet now washing feet was normal based on their culture and based on 
just the normalness of living in that time and the attire of the day. But it wasn't normal for the, for the rabbi, the instructor, the leader, to wash the feet of the student. It was normal that in every setting, the student would wash the feet of the leader. It's the way it was. And now in this upper room, very well planned. It is not happenstance. It's not just we got to get this last. Let's, let's, go, let's go have a meal. Jesus deliberately took a towel. You can read it. I, it, 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 it ought to send some, seriously, some shivers down our spine when we think about it again. Jesus took a towel. And I imagine all these men were watching. Jesus took a towel and took a basin of water and went one by one to those men and washed their feet. I think the disciples didn't know what to say. Peter always said something, and he said the wrong thing anyways. Again, you will never wash my feet. Not, not, ne never will you wash my feet. And she said, if I, if I don't wash you, you have no part of me. And remember Peter's response? Wash my whole body then. Yeah. Just wash me all over. Peter had a way of opening his mouth quickly and saying what was on his heart. And it wasn't always the right thing, but I appreciate his courage and passion. Jesus washed the feet of the disciples. And I know I've mentioned this before, and you know it. He washed Judas's feet. If, um, how many has ever had the occasion to have someone else wash your feet? Anybody? One? Two? Yeah. I have, I have, I've had it twice, and both times was in like a preaching scenario for just an object lesson. And I've also washed someone else's feet. In fact, just last year I preached a message on this uh, particular passage at HBI Chapel up in Cleveland. And, and I brought one of the students up and I washed their feet. I think that was two years ago, maybe three. And uh, I had that same individual come up to me just a few months ago and said, I'll, he was the one that I washed his feet. He said, I will never forget it my whole life. It's a, um, it's a unique feeling. But I want you to consider this. Judas knew what he was going to do. And Jesus knew what he was going to do. You know, it created this little dynamic here. I think the other disciples were a little clueless. But Judas knew and Jesus knew. And Judas, while he's seated there, sees the Lord Jesus come and put a basin under his feet. And I believe just as tenderly, compassionately, and carefully as he washed the feet of John, he washed Judas's too. Jesus said, as you should love one another as I have loved you, loved you. What makes it new is we have the example of Christ. I trust you're saved tonight, you're born again. You know what this new commandment's all about? It's about us reflecting the love of Christ to one another that he's reflected on us. And that's a whole new thing. You say, well, I know unsaved people. They, they, you know, husbands and wives can love one another. They're not even saved. And kids can love their parents and they're not even saved. But they can't do this. Because this is, I want you to love one another as I have loved you. There's an experience part to this new commandment. And it makes the commandment marvelous and wonderful and deep and, and, tr and, and, and just uh, thrilling to love one another as Christ has loved us. Anyone can love the lovely. Jesus said, if you love them which love you, what thank have ye? For sinners also love those that love them. And if you do good to them that do good to you, what thank have ye? For sinners also do even the same. And if you lend to them of whom you hope to receive, what thank have ye? For sinners also lend to sinners and to receive as much again. But love your enemies and do good and lend, hoping for nothing again. And your reward shall be great, and ye shall be the children of the highest, for he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. So yes, it's commandable, this love one another, and it is new in that we have the example of Christ, which is a, a, a great part of being a Christian. One more thing about this as we uh, uh, wrap this up tonight, in verse number 35, where Jesus said this, by this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another.
Because, see, something happens. When you live this out, something happens. Some evidence occurs. Some identity comes forth. Some impression or imprint is, is now visible. Uh, they, I, I saw on a show I was watching that was a crime show, and, and somebody had a firearm that they used in a, in a murder, and they had grinded off the serial numbers of the, of the firearm so that it was, you couldn't read the serial numbers. And this uh, forensics or whatever they use, they use this some kind of solution or chemical, and they put it on the metal where there's no numbers on the metal, but they put this, they put this uh, solution on the metal, and they said the part of the metal that was depressed or compressed more than the other parts, this metal reveals the more compressed, or this, this uh, liquid com reveals the more compressed metal from the uncompressed metal. And when they rubbed this, this uh, liquid on there, the numbers just sort of appeared. Just like that. It was there, but it brought it forth. Now, I think what the Lord Jesus is saying here is when you practice this loving one another, I'm talking about among believers, among the church family, among, among people that know Christ as, as, as Savior, when you practice that, something comes out. You say, who sees it? Jesus said, all men. By this shall all men know. All men. When it's lived out, now it becomes an outward testimony. And although I understand that this commandment is for believers, now not that you say, well, I'm only supposed to love Christians. I ain't loving nobody else. This commandment specifically is for believers. Love one another. There should be something special among believers. But the fact that Jesus said, shall all men know that you are my disciples, means that this command also has a benefit to everybody out there in the world. Every unsaved person benefits from this being lived out. Because now they see Christ, now they see the Lord, now they see God, now they see the imprint of Jesus Christ. It wasn't so much that by loving one another in the church we could know who's saved or unsaved. It's so that by loving one another, the people that are unsaved will say, certainly those people know God. So it becomes not so much a, a, a deal for, for church understanding of sheep and goats. and it, It's not so much about that. It's more for witnessing. This command is so that as Christians love one another, an empowerment comes. A, 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 an, an endowment comes from God that now all men will know that you are my disciples. So when we share Christ, what do we need? We need the Holy Spirit to guide us to what to say. We need to have courage to say it. But we also need for them to know that we are of God, that we are born of God, that our message that we bring is not our own. The book of Acts, all of those sign gifts that we've been talking about in the book of Acts were not so that Paul would get glory. It's so that when someone would hear Paul preach and then see him heal a man, they would say, well, certainly what Paul says must be from God because he just healed a man. And people were getting saved, right? Everywhere Paul went, people were getting saved. Because there was a confirmation that Paul was certainly of the Lord because of the evidence. Now, if I can say this, it may be that our, that our gospel efforts aren't as strong as they should be because of the failure to love one another. That failure. Because when that is lived out, when loving one another is lived out among the saints... It brings forth that identity of Christ that all the world can see. It, it, it really, uh, it, you're familiar with the word fishing, uh, not F-I-S-H-I-N-G, but P-H-I-S-H-I-N-G, fishing with the P-H. That's uh, sort of a, a new thing lately through this technology, but they'll, they'll send you th something in an email or a text, and they will, will fake or purport that they are some other big company. You know, you'll get this email with, Verizon's header, and uh, we just want you to know that unless you give us, uh, you know, these particular, uh, you know, uh, there's a problem paying your Verizon bill, so please send us the routing numbers for your checking account again, please. And they're phishing, P-H-I-S-H-I-N-G. They are purporting to be someone that they are not. And we know today that's being very successful. It, Obviously, it's, it's their success uh, 
thankfully not with me yet, but uh, there has been success in the fishing. You know, when we try to witness for Christ, but there's not really a true love one another like Christ loved us, we're just really purporting to be something that we're not. It's almost like fishing. Well, yeah, they want me to make some profession, but man, in their marriage, I see them fighting all the time. Just think about it. All oh, those two, they, they, they fight all day long. And they want me to be saved? They're talking to me about the Lord? It's like we're purporting to be something, someone that we're not. Well, yeah, that, you know, I, I know my teammate plays ball with me and he says he's a Christian, but all he does, he hates his brother. I could tell he hates his brother. He hates his sister. Well, how can we witness for Christ and purport ourselves to be of the Lord when there's no identity of shall all men know that you're my disciples if you love one another? It provides an outward testimony and an order, ownership testimony. And without loving one another, and I, I'm not just talking about in the church, I'm saying that, that uh, this extends to a lot of places. Husbands and wives, if you're both saved, love one another. Children to your parents, if you know Christ is your Savior, love one another. Siblings, brothers and sisters, if you know Christ, if you're saved, love one another. Love one another. Because without it, no part of your Christianity seems real. Maybe that's, that might, may sound a little forceful. But without loving one another as Christ loved us, everything we say of our Christianity loses its authenticity. It's empty. Jesus said, by this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one toward another. It's really what makes witnessing work. I, I, I know we... I don't want to labor this long tonight, but mom and dad, when you have children and you want your children to trust Christ, you want them to be saved, you want them to know God, listen to me now, husband and wife, you better love one another as Christ loved you. Because the identity of Christ as a mom and dad love one another is what brings that indelible mark for a boy or girl to say, my mom and dad do know Christ and they do know God and what they've told me about the gospel makes sense and is real. Loving one another is not something trite. It's what makes all men know that we are his disciples. Whether it's uh, uh, even saved people at work. I, I'll give you this illustration and then bring this to a close quickly. Well, remember when we, we played in that softball tournament? I remember we played in that, not softball tournament, we played in the softball league for a while, church softball league. How many played in our church softball league? I know there's some still left here. Um, us, us old timers here. Pat was our ace pitcher, you know. Um, but anyways, I, I don't, I don't want to nitpick tonight, but some of you will remember, we played some games where it, it, it got a little ugly. I'm not talking about the way we played either. I mean, that was ugly all the time, but uh, I mean, like just the uh, uh, tempers were, remember sometimes some tempers got bad. So you were there. Sadly. And you know, every time that, and we were playing other churches, uh, we're all Christians, saved, we profess Christ. And I know we're just in the flesh and none of us are perfect and, and, and I struggle and fight with this also, but I, and, and, and I, I think you'll agree with me on this. Every time it happened, I thought this should not be. It should not be. And I know it was, but it should not be. By this shall all men know that you're my disciple if you have love one to another. It's an abiding kind of love. When you have time as... We won't do it tonight, but in 1 John chapter number 4, there's a lot said in there about loving one another. Also, 1 John 4, also written by John the Apostle. One verse that I want to bring out as I close is the Bible says that if you love one another, uh, that it will cause you to cast out fear, that perfect love casteth out fear, uh, and that we'll be able to stand. This is in 1 John 4, 17, that we will stand before him in confidence at the judgment. If I can say a word about this uh, tonight uh, and then conclude. Uh, there's another side and facet to this about loving one another brings a benefit when we stand before God. 
Because John the, the Apostle, under the inspiration of God, brings out that when we love one another, it casts out our fear that when we stand before God in the judgment, we can stand before him in confidence. You say, what, is, what does all that mean? I, I, I will admit that I, I don't think I understand the depth and breadth of it completely. But I do know this, that when I stand before God, when I stand at the judgment seat of Christ, part of the confidence that I have in standing there is that knowing that I'm a Christian is identified by how I loved the believer and one another. For instance, if we stand before him in judgment and the deeds of our life are brought and the deeds of our life are, are brought before in such a way that there is very little evidence of love for the brethren and love for one another and very little evidence of sincere Christ-like love for one another, Scripture says that may bring a little fear in judgment. You can read it yourself. It may bring a little fear in judgment. Because part of the confidence that we have that we are in Christ and in God and abiding in him, it's all through 1 John chapter number 4, the confidence that we have that we are in God is in the fact that we love one another. You're doubting your salvation? It could be a lack of loving one another that brings the doubt. Nervousness about eternity could be a lack of loving one another. Thereby ye shall know that ye are in him if ye love one another. It brings a confidence of our salvation. And it brings the abiding presence of God into our life. There's a, a divine energy that comes by loving one another. Someone say, why should I? What have they done for us? What have they done for me? They may have done nothing for you. But there's some things from God that you want. That I want. Do you want to know more of the Lord? Do you want a sweeter walk with God? I trust that you do. I do. Well, here's, here's really what 1 John 4 says. You want a sweeter walk with God? Then you love others more. And I, it's a little mysterious how it happens. But as we give ourselves in love to someone else, it's as if the love of God comes upon us, not, not, not in more measure, but in more experience, right? We live in our, in our selfish bubble, in our, in, our, in, our, in our sphere of, well, I just can't, or I won't, or, or this loving one another is not what I'm going to do. We live in that kind of sphere. We have sort of put a block. God loves us as much as he'll ever love us, but you won't experience it the same without loving one another. Because by loving this way, is how he abides in me, and I abide in him. So here's how I'll close. If, if there is relationship problems, not that we lose our salvation, but if there is some kind of distance this way, sometimes correcting our relationships this way corrects this relationship that way. In other words, God says, I'll abide in you. You'll abide in me. You'll understand the abiding in me. If you'll love one another. Boy, this is a commandment. There's a, certainly a newness to it. And I believe it will help our witnessing. It will help our sharing the gospel. Can we bow our heads quietly for prayer tonight?